Well, good morning. How are we doing this morning? I like that. You guys, you guys, I got to be honest with you. I was listening to y'all over here during worship and y'all were getting after it. And that was, that's encouraging to a pastor, amen? Here's, here folks singing and worshiping God. Uh, we are really, really excited you guys are here. Thanks for coming. If you guys are joining us online, we are we're really glad that you are here. Um, like I said earlier, if you're new, just type new in the comments and someone will connect with you uh, from our group. So uh, anyways, well, like I said, we're glad that you guys are here. And uh, this morning, uh, this part of the service is going to look a little bit different than it normally does. So um, I just wanted to let you guys know that that's coming. There's going to be a shift coming. Everything's okay. Don't Flip out, it's gonna be good. Um, But go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 25. That's kind of where we're gonna live for the next just few minutes. And I say few minutes, being honest. Okay, so um, while you guys are turning there, if you don't have a Bible, if you didn't bring one with you, there's one, there should be a hardback black one in the seat around you somewhere. If you don't own a Bible, you can keep that one, take it with you as you go home. Um, And, uh, but that will be on page 881 in in that Bible. So, I want, while you guys are turning there, I want to ask you guys, can any of you remember a time in your life, um, a moment where you were confronted with an idea or, or, or with a truth uh, that was so real, it was so powerful that it just, in that moment, it changed everything for you? Like the moment that you realized that, you know, cartoons weren't real or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? But there's a moment where something hits and you're like, what? And you're faced with that truth, and, and, and it changes. Well, um, that is what this passage in Matthew 25 did for me um, in 2008. And so um, I wanted to share this with you guys. I was on staff as Director of Contemporary Worship at Covenant United Methodist Church in Dothan, Alabama at the time. I'd been there uh, for about two years, Taylor and I had, and we were still newly married. We just got married, and we were beginning to... Those of you that have been married for a while will get what I'm fixing to say. Those of you that are just getting married, you're in this moment. We we were just beginning to live life. Do you know what I'm saying? We're like, you get married and you're like, okay, life begins, right? Um, But we were just beginning to live life. We had two dogs, a small three-bedroom house on on, on a cul-de-sac, and um, and life was good, right? Life was was great. Well, enter one Sunday morning. Uh, we were uh, we had invited the children's ministry at the church had invited a children's choir um, uh, to come in and to perform for the church and they were a group from an organization called World Help and uh, they they'd come to perform and the choir was composed of children they were like eight to eleven I believe um, uh, they were uh, were composed of children from uh, that lived and they lived in children's homes. All, um, all over the world, right? And so the homes that they lived in, uh, they were from, um, you know, Africa and from uh, Nepal and from, uh, I think there was from China, from all over. But the homes that they lived in, they uh, offered, offered food and shelter and education to these kids who would otherwise not be able to afford it, wouldn't be able to get it. And some of the kids in the choir were orphans and um, uh, resulting, res- a, or a, uh, orphans as a result of the AIDS epidemic in Africa. Some uh, were orphans for other reasons. And, uh, but some had parents, but the parents were, just couldn't afford to keep the kids at home. So in order to give them a better chance at life, they'd sent them to live at one of these homes where they could get an education and medical care and, and all of those things. And so the kids were on stage and they sang and they danced and, and they shared their testimonies with us. And they did it all in order to promote child sponsorship right, for, for kids that were in the homes with them. Like they knew these kids that they were raising support for, um, as well as uh, support for the other ministries that World Help was doing in their, uh, in the communities where these homes were located. And I'm just gonna be honest with you, like it was awesome. The kids were great. It was, it was phenomenal. I had a blast. Um, I remember, you know, high-fiving the children's ministry at the church after. I was like, you nailed that. That was great. And she was like, I didn't do anything. And I was like, it was still great, you know. So it, 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 was, it was fantastic. So I left with a big smile on my face. I thoroughly enjoyed the entire thing. But Taylor was moved. Um, that night, the Holy Spirit began to work on her in a big way. Um, she began uh, over the next several weeks and several months to talk to me about what we could do as, as, as a family, what we could do to, to help, to do more. We, resp- we sponsored a child, and, but you know, what, what more could we do? Um, she even was like, you know, maybe, maybe we, could, we could apply to work for world help. 
right? And become one of these team leaders for this choir, as you know. And uh, I was like, nope. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I mean, we were like, we were just getting started in life, right? I, we, we had, uh, we both had good jobs. We had friends. Things were going just like they were supposed to go when you live life, right? And, and I, but I told her, and I meant this, I, I told her that I'd pray about it, right? Which was a mistake. Um, but I, no, no, no. I, I told her I'd pray about it, and I did. And then the Holy Spirit began to go to work in me. Okay, so have you ever gotten into, have you guys ever gotten into an argument with the Holy Spirit? You know, like, like he's leading you to do something and you're not entirely excited about it. In fact, you might not necessarily want to do it, but at the same time, you want to follow his leading, right? You want to do what it is that he's calling you to do. You're just not very excited about it. So what do you do, right? You, well, what I did, anyways, was instead of just listening and doing what he was calling me to do, um, I started trying to talk him out of it, right? You're like, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I told him, I was like, Holy Spirit, come on, man, we just got married. We're just settling into life. He's like, you can lead your family. And I'm like, golly, what am I gonna do with that? And then he's, you know, I was like, we just bought a house. He was like, I'm bigger than your finances, right? Which didn't help. Um, and, and I was like, we've got two dogs. What am I gonna do with two dogs? And then my mom called and said they'd take them, right? So the Holy Spirit is just checking these things off the list as I'm, as, as I'm getting into this with him. So, I mean, you don't win. Just let me let you guys know. If you're trying to follow the Holy Spirit and you get into an argument, you're gonna lose, okay? So it just doesn't work. You never win. But as I was going through this, I was also reading through the book of Matthew at the time that, you know, I was in these, this conversation with the Holy Spirit. And, and it wasn't long after one of my attempts to talk the Holy Spirit out, to be like, you got the wrong guy, dude, um, to talk him out of calling us to go and, and work for world help, that I came across this passage. See, my mantra had become, while this was going on, while this, this conversation with the Holy Spirit was going on, my mantra had become, God, I, I want to follow you, but I'm a worship pastor. That's what you've called me to do. You called me to the ministry when I was 15. I knew this was where I was headed, right? I'm doing exactly what you've called me to do. And so that'd become my mantra. So I was like, I'm not sure if you've got the right guy, you know? So I want us to read this passage and then we're just gonna talk about it for just a few minutes and we got something a little bit different that we're gonna do. So we're gonna go to Matthew chapter 25. We're gonna read, uh, start in verse 31. So it says a lot of verses you guys settle in and, uh, and uh, read with me. So it says this, when the son of man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, he will sit, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. The king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed or, and feed you or, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or, or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You see, I'd read this passage many, many times before. It wasn't a new passage. It was one of those things, uh, you know, sometimes when you're reading through scripture, if you read through something you've read before, if you're not careful, you can kind of blast through it. You're like, oh, I know what this says. I've read this before. Um, so I'd read this a lot. But the thing about the word of God, and we've talked about this, is that it's alive and it's active, okay? And when you're a follower of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, right? So it is, there's always wisdom. There's always something to draw from it. And it's not something that you draw yourself. It's something that the Holy Spirit reveals to you as you read his word. So it's full of unending wisdom and, and instruction. And that's why you can read a passage today like we're doing now, and you can get one thing from it. And then you can read that same passage three months, six months, a year later, and you can get something totally different. God can reveal some, a completely different thing to you from the same passage of scripture. And that's what happened to me. 
God hit me hard. I mean, I remember sitting at my desk in my office and feeling like God just crawled up into my lap, right, and whispered into my ear. He said, you want to follow me? Feed the hungry. Give water to the thirsty. Take in the stranger. Care for the sick. That's how you follow me, Jay. You see, I knew that I was called to the ministry as a pastor. Like, I knew that. I've known, like I said, since I was 15 years old and when I answered that call. And I said, God, if that's you, what you want me to do, that's what I'll do. That was my calling. That's what I did. That was a big part of my identity was I was called to the ministry. I was a pastor. But the thing that I had forgotten was that my first calling was as a child of God. So the Holy Spirit he calls us, right, all to do different things, right? The body of Christ needs different kinds of people, right? We need, uh, we need doctors and electricians and lawyers and landscapers and builders and teachers. We need, we need serious people, right? And, and then we need funny people. And we need, uh, we need the dreamers who are just up there in the clouds doing whatever it is that goes on up there in the clouds. And then we need the folks who are naturally a little more grounded, who reach up there and grab the people in the clouds by the ankle and snatch them back down, right? We, so we need all of these. As a body, we need them operating in these different roles to carry out the work that Christ wants to do, like in our faith family and in the world, and, and, and outside the church. So we need all of these different types of people. But here's the thing, guys. All of those roles, they're all secondary. Those are all secondary roles. The primary call on the life of every believer is to be sheep first. To be followers first. Right? And a, a follower of Jesus before anything else. Right? I'm not identified by how well I lead worship. That, that, that's not my call at the time. It wasn't that I'm a pastor and, and I, lead, I, 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 I lead worship and, and I want to do that well. That's fine, but that's not my calling. My first calling is to be a follower of Christ. I'm a follower of Christ who was leading worship. I wasn't the worship leader. But my first calling was to be a follower of Christ. And the thing is, in, in this passage, Jesus says that his sheep are identified. If I'm going to be a follower of Christ, how, what does that look like? He says they are identified by how they meet the needs of those around them. Look at verse 35. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. That's a really long list of things. As a believer, I believe our, the call in our lives is we see a need, we meet a need. I think that's what Jesus is saying. You see something that's wrong, you see something, and you meet the need. We see people who are hurting or alone or, or, or are cast aside, and we step into their lives. We step into that, and we meet that need. We come alongside them. We walk with them. We minister to them. And here's the thing. We're not just ministering to them. I think this is the amazing thing about this passage. They didn't even realize who they were ministering to, right? We're not just ministering to them. We're ministering to Jesus at the same time that we're meeting the needs of those who are around us. In the parable, the ones who ministered, they didn't even know that they were ministering to Jesus. They were just, I mean, they were just loving those around them. They were just meeting needs. They saw a need, they met a need. Look at verse 37. Then the righteous will answer. I love the fact that followers of Christ get to be called righteous. Um, that, that's, a, that's incredible. Um, anyways, uh, then the righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I think this goes right back to in Acts when, when, uh, uh, in Acts when, when, when Paul has his encounter, well, before he's Paul, when he has his encounter, right? And, and he, says, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you? And he says, Jesus. He wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the church, right? But Jesus' response to him was, why are you persecuting me? He took it personal. 
because that's how he identifies. It's the same thing here. You know, I feel like God has a special place in his heart for those who are on the outside, right? For, uh, for the least of these, as, as he calls them in this passage. And honestly, I believe it's because, <laughs> I believe it's because as far as God's concerned, when it comes to need, every one of us is the least of these, Right? Every single one of us. In Ephesians chapter two, you guys don't have to turn there. Um, If you start in verse one, he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin. And in verse three, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under under wrath as others were also. But God, two of my favorite words in scripture, anytime you see but God, a change is coming. Amen? Amen. Anyways, in verse four, he says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. You were saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. See, we were all the least of these when it came to our spiritual condition before Christ saved us. But we were made alive in Christ, not just made alive. He raised us up. We've talked about this, that we're co-heirs with Christ. We're seated on the throne with Christ. So Christ came down and he ministered to us. And the expectation here is that we're going to go out and minister to each other, to our families here and in our faith family. And then we're gonna take it a step further and minister to the world around us. That's the expectation. What God hit me with that day when I was reading this passage was that he wanted me to put feet to Matthew 25. If I was willing to accept Christ's ministry in my own life, and I was as a follower of his, if I was willing to accept the the reconciliation that his sacrifice brought between, between me and God, then I, if I was gonna call myself a follower of Christ, I better be willing in some small measure to extend that same ministry to those in need of it. And that meant doing whatever I could to see a need and to meet a need. And in this case, that meant that my wife and I spent the next 350 days living in an RV, traveling the country with 14 children from Africa and Nepal as their legal guardians, sharing their testimonies and asking anyone who would listen to partner with us to meet the needs of other kids just like them all over the world. And I'm not, (laughs) I'm not going to lie. And if Taylor was here, you could ask her after the service. Um, It was a really hard year for me. Okay. Sometimes when we step into something God's called us to do, the temptation is to think I'm stepping into this. Everything's going to come up roses, right? I stepped into it and I'm just going to say, it didn't smell like roses. Are y'all tracking with me? It was, it was a hard year for me. Uh, for one, um, I hate driving. And when you are part of a traveling children's choir and the only one on the, in the group with a CDL, you drive a lot. But I can tell you that God did some amazing things through those kids and I got to watch it happen. He did some amazing things. I saw him change lives. I saw him change kids' lives. I saw him change the lives of people that were apart, like you guys here, like watching what was going on as they partnered with us. And I I saw him change me. And and I was blessed to be a part of, of, of doing what I could to minister to the least of these. And the reason that I wanted to share this with you guys today is because as a church, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to make an impact here in our, in, in our local community over the holiday season and to, to do exactly what I'm talking about, to see a need and to meet a need. There are currently hundreds of kids in the Claremont County foster care system, hundreds of them, just in our local area. And, and we felt like God was leading us as a church to see how, how we could minister to those kids um, over, the, over the holidays. What, what could we do to, to show the love of, of Christ 
to them. And, and we've been given an opportunity uh, to partner with uh, Claremont County Child Protective Services to, to, to help bless some children this Christmas. Um, but before we go in, into the details, uh, I'd like to share a story with you guys. We've got just a, a video we want to show with, with, we want to share a personal story from someone in our church family who's been affected by, by, by the foster care, care system. Now, before we go any further, before this video plays, I want you guys to hear me say, this is not me standing in front of you calling for our church to foster everyone, you know, to foster a bunch of kids for Christmas. That's not the call this morning. We have an opportunity to partner with them. That's where God's leading you. Pray through that and we can talk through that. But that's not what this is this morning. This is a, an opportunity we have as a body to bless some kids over Christmas. So you guys check out this video and then we will unpack it a little bit, okay? Okay. 